Hello everyone and welcome to today. I hope you're all keeping well and you've had a wonderful week and uh, been blessed in many ways and for those that have uh, endured and struggled through health issues, through whatever issues and uh, uh, tribulations and trials that you've gone through, I pray that the Lord has got you through it and you will be able to see His hand of protection over your life during these days. So before we open up, let's give our time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We just thank you for another day that we can spend with you. Lord, even if it's here on earth until we meet you again, we just give you thanks and praise and we, we adore your name. And we just ask that you will be able to guide us through this message and let those who have ears hear the message and those that see what you are doing spiritually be able to see how you are moving across this land and across this globe and in our lives. So we give this, me this message in honor and praise to you, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we spoke about a number of things, which was part one of our patterns and promises. And last week we spoke about Exodus, uh, which was talking about the idolatry and the, the repentance and the, sh the shattered tablets, and uh, gave us this significance of, of the Lord's willingness to for us to turn our hearts back to Him and in all spirit and all truth. We also looked at uh, Ezekiel and talking about those uh, dry bones and the preparation for the body resurrection, the spiritual regeneration and also the birth of the, the church which could be the revival of the church in our days. But um, the restoration of uh, Israel and the resurrection of Israel or the national Israel in end times was another message that we looked at. Message of hope to a despondent people again talking about the four winds, the four directions and four corners, talking, which, which ultimately is talking about God's rule, Abraham's inheritance and Jesse's offspring. And then the prayer for miracles and the choice, uh, choices and the remnant of his people. And then we looked at Daniel, and Daniel spoke about the visions, the kings and the kingdoms, and prayers for his people. We also looked at Hav. The month of Av, that's a spiritual month of uh, the Hebrew calendar, which was always to will and design. We're coming to the end of that today. And uh, I'll let you have a look at what we're going into in the next spiritual month. But it also, you know, gave us a glimpse of the uh, account in numbers with the 10 negative reports, which we've covered. And the gift of free will, free choice, as well as the unbelief being a lack of love. And a fresh revelation of God's covenantal relationship that we should be seeking, as well as having our spiritual eyes and ears open, and also the promised land that Jesus died for us. And then, of course, Jesus himself, we spoke about the tax uh, collectors and about them questioning his fasting, and in Ephesians, talking about the great uh, mystery. So, you know, we can go straight into today, today, which we're going to continue on those uh, accounts, but going a little bit further into the passage that we may be able to understand uh, the good and pleasing will of our Lord. And if we have a look at the first uh, book that we're going to look at, it's taken from Exodus chapter 33. And that's just after uh, the discussion that we had last week of uh, the uh, people uh, and the golden calf. Now, in Exodus chapter 33, it was uh, the command to leave uh, Sinai. And... Uh, when we have a look at this from a, a biblical point of view, the Lord then said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, and to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hiphite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Herod. Now, if you have a look at the, the geographical map, you'll be able to understand the journey that they were going from uh, Mount Sinai through to Mount Herob, and that was depicting the journey that they were going. Yahweh was basically saying, despite your sin, move forward. And that sin could be unbelief. That sin could be a lack of love. That sin could be doubt. 
could be fear, could be many, many, many things. But in this, in this context that we're reading, Yahweh intended that Israel continue to move forward despite her sin. We also spoke about how God deciding to withdraw himself from their midst and those uh, that were that was an indefinite time which they were unaware of God's final verdict so it gives us an indication that not only shouldn't we, we should be focusing on our Lord and all that we do because he leads us by a cloud during the day and by fire uh, during the night so that we can see where we're going but he's also saying to us be careful because if you continue in the sin we may be able to be led but it won't be under his hand of protection we've got to make sure that we want to stay under his hand of protection so that he may be able to lead us well as he did with the Israelites even though they went through that period in the wilderness now remember last week we spoke about how he uh, uh, called for the tabernacle the artisans for the building of the tabernacle and that was something that would allow God's presence to dwell so basically what Moses did is he set aside his tent a little bit uh, separate from from everyone and it was there that the, ta the tabernacle of meeting was the place where God's presence would be and Moses placed a great distance between himself being him in the camp and of the uh, molded calf because he didn't want to be est established or linked to the uh, idolatry worship so what happened was is he set himself aside and then the Lord's presence remained with him in that tent and that's where that whole uh, uh, situation with regards to the tabernacle of meetings came into into being it also talks about the promises of God's presence. So I'll let you read chapter 33, but I want to touch on a couple of uh, things that we may be able to do because it says that uh, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not led, uh, let me know whom you will send me with. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, Show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now if we look at the word rest, Strong's Accordance 5117 tells us that it's to settle down, to rest, to be soothed or to be quieted, to be secure and to be still. Remember that verse, be still. And know that I am God. And it occurs about 65 times. Uh, first in generation, uh, Gen Genesis, sorry, uh, chapter 8, verses 4, which states that the ark rested on the mountain of Aratat, remember, in, in Turkey? And Nuach is the verb that describes the Spirit of God resting upon the Messiah or upon the 70 elders of Israel. And the name Noah, which is the rest giver, or comforter is the derived from Nuach which is in Genesis 5 verses 29 and it's talking about the present reference God's presence will give rest to his people that is his presence soothes comforts and settles and consoles and quietens then it goes on to say then he said to him if your presence does not go with us do not bring us up from here for how then will it be known that your people and I found grace in your sight except you go with us so we shall be separate your people and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth so the Lord said to Moses I will also do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name and he said please show me your glory show me your glory is basically being in his in God's presence all the time and just uh, being in his splendor and if we ever look at a kingdom dynamic, it talks about being lost in his wonder. And, you know, this is about growing and knowing the Lord. And it's Moses' passionate plea to see God's glory in one of the most intimate encounters between a man and God ever recorded. His request is not for a display of God's power, even the warmth of his presence. But he hungered for something more. Moses wanted an intimate knowledge of God himself. He didn't want second-hand experiences or intimacy he wanted firsthand intimacy and that's why God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and manifested his glory so that Moses was not only exposed to the light of the divine afterglow but enraptured by the fullness of his person his character the one who is compassionate gracious and just 
Yes, Moses had received God's promises, seen God's power, and been guaranteed of God's presence. But Moses wanted God's person. And that's what we should all be striving for, is for his person. The only reality will ever evoke a lasting sense of wonder and fulfill with a lasting satisfaction. Remember last week I spoke about one day being better than a thousand years with the Lord. It's that one intimate encounter that will drive you closer and closer and closer to the Lord through his word, worship and prayer. So I want to encourage you with that verse, which is the opening one. Leaving uh, Sinai, uh, in d- despite of your sin, continue to move forward was Yahweh's uh, response. And as they continued, they uh, renewed their mind and started realizing that they were, ent- they were going towards the promised land. And that was an important thing for people to realize, was that it wasn't uh, just a, a silly thing that they were doing. This was eternity that they were going towards. They were going towards the inheritance, Abraham's inheritance, or Abraham's in- inheritance. But let's go and have a look at Ezekiel, because we touched on it last week, talking about the opening verses of Uh, chapter 37 which spoke about um, the dry bones today we're going to be looking at the one kingdom one king and I'll let you read from chapter 37 verses 15 right through to 28 and it's talking about uh, a number of things because the Lord came to Ezekiel saying as for you son of man take a stick for yourself write on it for Judah and for the other children of Israel his companions then take another stick and write on it for Joseph and the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, and the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from amongst the nations, wherever they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all, and they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. David, my person, uh, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd, and they shall all walk in my judgments, and observe my statues, and do them. And... If we have a look at that, which talks about the covenantal relationship that uh, God has with his people in this account, we can talk about, we can see that this oracle of the two sticks represented the lasting symbolic, uh, the last symbolic uh, uh, representation that Ezekiel did with a, with a material object. And Jude and Ephraim were, were uh, united as one nation, and there would be one king, as we've just read. And another passage of scripture, and I'll test you on this and ask you to perhaps maybe reflect on which passage of scripture this comes from. But there's another passage of scripture that links with these two sticks, and it's called Beauty and Bonds. And I'd encourage you to go and look for the verse that uh, talks about uh, this passage of scripture, and feel free to put it in the comment section. But David, my servant, is talking about, about the messianic ruler from the line of David, which is King Jesus. That's why it says, one kingdom, one king. And he will be a man after God's own heart, as David was. He just loved the Lord with all his heart. And also this is then clearly fulfilled by Jesus Christ, or in Jesus Christ. And it also speaks a little bit later in verse 26 of the covenant of peace, which spoke of the the kings and the prophets and priests who were the shepherds, and they were to supply the water and food for the flock and uh, to destroy those who would bring any harm and to defend the, the rights of the weak, which may be the widow, the, orf- or the orphan, or even the alien. And also as a result of uh, the, the neglect, the sheep were scattered. But it does say that God will intervene and gather the scattered sheep from all the nations as the good shepherd that he is, and bring them back into his loving arms. And he will judge the sheep who have done wrong, but also will, his people will be their God. also speaks about how the prophets and the priests failed 
um, but it does say that David being his servant and uh, offering a covenant of peace. So that's a message for us to continue being aware of, is that while we want to uh, bring glory to God, bring honor to God, we've got to do so collectively, because uh, perhaps maybe one may, it may be too burdensome for one, as it says, uh, Moses chose the 70 elders so that they would share the load, share the burden. And this is where we can, as brothers and sisters in Christ, be able to stand in the gap with each other so that not only can we bring people into the kingdom of God, we can, we can, we can fill the blanks where the other ones aren't able to fill themselves, which then creates uh, that spiritual unity and the building up of the body of Christ, which is so, so important, which then brings about that covenant of peace through the Davidic line and the one kingdom and the one king, which is coming. And if we go back into Daniel, uh, we looked at a couple of verses, 7, 8, and 9 last week of Daniel. And today we're going to be looking at uh, 10 and 11. And it's talking about the vision of the glorious man, as well as uh, the warring kings of the north and the south. Now, I'd like to just spend a bit of time on this, because it's a little bit, uh, well, it's very important that we, that we understand the context of this, this, this passage. Because now we're going into, from chapter 10 to 12. Remember last week I spoke about how the first couple of chapters were in Hebrew, then it went to uh, Aramaic, Amoraic, and uh, then chapters 10 to 12 was going back to Hebrew. And I find that quite encouraging because in the beginning of time it was the Hebrew language, the, the Ruach, the Spirit of God that spoke to his people, but because of their disobedience they scattered them and changed the language when Babylon came about and no one could understand the true nature and will of God, which then caused that great confusion, that great fear, and that great distance between the intimacy between man and God, or women and God, or children and God. And now it's exciting because that chapters 10 to 12 starts taking us back into the, the, the Hebrew language. And it's now getting us back into our first love. And it's important to understand that uh, some of these verses are talking about what will be fulfilled. Let's have a, a look at verses, uh, chen, uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 10 verses 1 onwards. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had, un had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks, ate no pleasant food, nor meat or wine, and came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now on the twenty-fourth day of that first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold, Uphaz. Uphaz. His body was like beryl, and his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of the multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. If you've ever had an encounter with the Lord, and you've heard him speak to you, or you've seen some visions that, you, that he's uh, given to you, you'd be able to understand that in a deeper context. And we're going to get later into it, talking about water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. But it's important for us to understand that perhaps maybe in this context is that Daniel's uh, a purity, not to bow down to uh, Baal and uh, worship the king, but to remain steadfast in his, his uh, honoring of the Lord, gave him that fresh revelation, not only in the physical sense of being able to be spiritually renewed, physically renewed, but also spiritually renewed so that he could hear and see God more clearly. That's why the others didn't hear him. But it was Daniel that heard him. And even so, when you do get these revelations that are um, beautiful, um, it's different for each and every one of us. But the point is, is making ourselves pure and ready, just like it was for that body resurrection and that spiritual, spiritual regeneration. That's important for us to continue contending for, because not only did that, uh, you know, start the church, but it can revive the church of these days. And I just want to encourage you with that, because that's such an important message for us, because when we start looking at the, the times and the seasons that we're living in, we know that the, the, the times and the seasons are leading towards 
uh, one step closer being back with our Heavenly Father. But if you have a look at around what's going on, which gives you indications, just this week there's been fires in Greece, there's been more flooding, uh, there's been a lot of things that, uh, you know, uh, have been uh, rockets attacking Israel again, you know, just in this last week, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem as well as Israel and its people that are, belong to the Lord. But if, whether that's in Israel, Greece, or anywhere else that's been affected by these devastating fires, including California um, and all over the world with earthquakes and stuff like that, we need to understand that our time is getting short, and we need to make sure that our hearts are ready and attuned and calibrated back to His love. You know, Daniel was mourning because of the continued reports on the state of Jerusalem, <laughs> as we do this week, and you know, even this week, there's reports coming out of Israel and Jerusalem that things are not well, and uh, you know, the people are just knowing that the Lord's return is near, so they are holding on to the fact that He is going to come back for them. But you know, there's still an opportunity of, of a window of opportunity for others to get back into right standing with their Heavenly Father that will allow them to be seated with Him or taken up when He, when he returns. It also talks about the visitation of the heavenly beings to reinforce Daniel's message, and uh, which was indeed from heaven. And you know, sometimes we can speak a word, we can prophesy a word without even knowing it. And also by doing so, we are actually being God's angels, warning the people of the times and the seasons so that they can get their relationship right with the Lord. Some still need to plow their hearts and get their hearts ready, but as long as they don't leave it too long, otherwise it'll be too late. So let's continue contending for the faith but bringing others into the kingdom at the same time it goes on to talk about how the prophecies concerning Persia and Greece now I touched on a second ago with um, uh, some of the fires going on in Greece and I just want to read a couple of notes and taken from verses 13 but I'll let you read chapter 10 in its entirety but I'm just going to just go through a couple of things here is that the clearest Old Testament prophecies and the earthly struggles often are reflected based on what is happening on earth we can see that, well, we can see what's happening on earth, but we can, we can understand what's going on in the, in the heavenlies. Now, if you just have a look at God, you know, save everybody that, that's been affected in the fires of Greece that uh, have caused so many people to be evacuated. But you can start understanding by seeing what we've seen with regards to the great fires, that there's a, there's a, there's a battle going on in the spiritual heavenlies. And if you read chapter 10 in its totality, you'll be able to understand that there's, a, the, the, there's prophecies concerning Persia and Greece in this context. But we understand that prayer and fasting may be able to affect the outcome. So that's why we continue to intercede through prayer and fasting that may be able to allow the Lord to move. Because the angelic visitations, which is in this instance of uh, verse 13, being the prince uh, Persia, would be uh, talking about the spiritual forces. Now I've just mentioned Greece, but there's a lot going on in Iran and Syria and all the things that are happening in there. Israel's going through a very unstable time during the season, but we continue to pray for them and uh, allow the Lord to do His His work because it'll be Him that will save Israel. And also, it's talking about, um, the, in, especially in relation to the destructive uh, interactions with God's people by those that are against God Himself. So you can uh, maybe understand through your spiritual eyes and ears what's going on during this time and season, but also making sure that we get our hearts ready also speaks of Michael being the senior angel and he's the one that actually wars against the, 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 the enemies of God's people and protects them and makes sure that they are not harmed in any, any way. And the heavenly beings realize that the fight with the Persian demonic, uh, demonic uh, guardian will be followed by a fight with Greece's demonic guardian. So, you know, I'm not saying that this fire that's happening in Greece is it, but I'm just saying that, you know, perhaps maybe if we, if we see what's going on in Greece, is this perhaps maybe something that's going on in the heavenlies with regards to Persia and Greece? And, you know, we don't know. Only the Lord knows. But, but it gives, certainly gives us a, a, a prophetic timeline because Israel is God's prophetic uh, timeline or, uh, you know, uh, land that, that we can see the times and the seasons. And in Daniel uh, 11, it talks about how it's warring against the kings of the north and uh, south. But this section does require familiarity with the history of the Persians and the Greeks, as I've just mentioned. So that's an important Bible study that we could all do during this time, is going deeper into what it means during this, this time in, in the book of Daniel. And maybe we may be able to understand, discern a little bit more about what's actually happening up in the heavenlies. 
but it's also focusing on this um, Antioch, Antiochus Ep Ep Epiphanes, excuse the pronunciation, um, and it also shows uh, the um, conflicts with the governments as kings seek power and wealth through war and invasion. So, so important. Just have a look at what's going on. Don't necessarily always look at what's going on in the mainstream media, but do your own research. We've been given a, a mind of Christ that will be able to discern and also to be able to give the... Um, what's the right word I'm looking for? I'll get it just now. But it's being able to, to, to look at uh, two different uh, sets of news that will be able to help us discern which one is actually true or not. And uh, that allows us to be able to use our intelligence, our spiritual eyes and ears that will give our Lord the glory. But uh, even though these events have passed many, many, many years ago, um, you know, they do occur centuries later after Daniel's prophecy, which means that sometimes a prophetic word can happen shortly afterwards or may take a number of years. Remember last week, how it, uh, as I warned Hezekiah that it, it would would happen in a hundred years time that they go into exile same thing but it also emphasizes the supernatural insight into uh, the prophet that was uh, given to him it talks about the south referring to Egypt having six uh, kings mentioned and the north being Syria seven of her kings mentioned and also the end of governments and rulers of this world are predicted hold that close to you Okay, so then we go to Matthew, and uh, last week we spoke about how um, Jesus was uh, spoken to or of regarding um, sitting with tax collectors, and uh, this week we're going to be looking at uh, the Great Tribulation. And I'm going to read from verse 15 of chapter 24 of Matthew. Therefore, when you see the abominations of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him who is on the housetops not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as such has not been seen it's, it's, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look here, here is the Christ, look there, do not believe it. For the false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have even told you beforehand. Therefore, if I say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will, this coming, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there is eagles that will be gathered together. Talking about the abomination of des the desolation, uh, that talks about uh, what we've learned a little bit about Daniel 9, 11 and 12, which we're not going to go into today. And it's applied by the author of uh, the uh, book of 1 Maccabees. And uh, sometimes the Lord puts things in your spirit and then you come across it in the verse and that's one of them that came into my spirit and was confirmed was uh, 1 Maccabees to the desecration of the temple of 168 BC. And if you look at uh, the history of the Maccabees, you'll be able to understand a little bit deeper in context, including in Daniel, um, uh, including the prophecies of Daniel. But Jesus also uh, views these prophecies as referring to the arrival of the Roman army, which besieged Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Remember how they destroyed the temple then? And that ev uh, event foreshadows the uh, conditions that uh, are connected with Christ's return. Remember that whole thing of the first coming and the second coming? And it's that struggle, it's that birth pangs that we are continuing to go through as the day and the hour gets closer. We've got to make sure that we are really tuned in His will and wanting to be able to, to, to just do His will for His glory when the opportunity arises. So the prophecy awaits ultimate fulfillment in a manner not clearly specified in Scripture. As we know, no one knows the day or the hour, but He is coming back. 
but Jesus gives sound practical advice to the believers and Christ Christians who heeded this warning were able to be uh, cared for. Well-taught followers of Christ will await the coming of the Lord from heaven. And as we continue to labor on, we must understand that uh, through the discernment of Holy Scripture, Holy Spirit, and also uh, our walk with the Lord, we've got to make sure that we are staying in step with Him. Staying in step. Even though we take those great leaps of faith and we want to come into the, and I'll touch on one in a second, we do so out of the obedience Perhaps maybe the Lord says, okay, I want to go before you. So don't be uh, despondent if, if what you are stepping out into doesn't work out immediately. But have faith and continue to prepare yourself. So when you take a step out again, he's gone before you and the doors will be open for you. So let's just pray into that because that's an important thing that I want to just touch on now. Because it's been on my heart for so, so many years to be able to just show the, the, the people the love of the Holy Land and, and what Jesus has not only done in my life but so, so many other people's lives and being able to bring them into the Holy Land to be able to, number one, see that He's risen because the grave is empty, the tomb is empty but number two, to be able to give, allow the Holy Spirit to be able to guide them through that uh, experience uh, on the ground, on the soil that He walked on but you know, the Lord has His uh, timings and we just got to trust Him for that so while we trust him for that, let's continue to be getting ready so that when we are able to go into the promised land, we'll be able to, be, um, we'll be able to reflect on scripture. Because uh, sometimes uh, people will experience and then reflect on scripture and then reflect on what it was when they were actually in that, uh, that, that time that they had actually experienced that. Or others will study the word of God get closer with him, get more intimate with him, like Daniel did with the fast, like we do with the fast, is having a fast so that we can be spiritually prepared for our bodily resurrection, but also to be able to re be regenerated and being able to uh, take that step of faith so that we can go into that promised land. And it's, it'll happen. We've just got to trust. We've got to have faith. And if you have enough faith to say, I want to go, I want you to reply and say, yes, please, put my name down. I'm keen. So I just want to hold that with you in prayer that the Lord will get the glory, but we take that step of obedience and make that offer. So I'm offering any of you who hear this message, if you do want to go, just uh, respond or reply and just say, yes, I'd like to put my name down. Anyway, let's continue. The Son of Man, the coming of the Son of Man, talks about how Jesus is re referring to the Great Tribulation and His return. And the teachings of Jesus showed... Uh, and should be um, uh, uh, give, given a spirit of watchfulness because we need to understand and discern the times and the seasons but uh, we are his followers and we are called to be watchful and mindful of his return and be able to tell others to come into his kingdom then it speaks of the parable of the fig tree and it's the budding trees and as we getting closer into uh, the summer and spring is here and I'm just looking at a tree that's starting to bloom um, it's, it's telling us that uh, this signifies the, the coming of summer. And the signs described by Jesus will give a warning of his coming. And even the, uh, the present generation would witness uh, these things and uh, many other things to come. But let's continue to hold fast to the faith and make sure that we are preparing ourselves. Because if we have a look at what, uh, what Paul said in um, Acts, you just go to Acts uh, 19. It speaks of Paul at Ephesus. Now remember last week we ended off with that passage from um, Ephesians, which was the great mystery, uh, being uh, you know every family in heaven on earth would be able to know the great glorious wonders of our Lord through his mysterious ways and just be uh, presented to him uh, in, in all wonder and splendor. Acts 19, I'm going to read the first few verses. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, and Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to him, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him 
who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And what happened in this passage was that Paul found that the group of disciples were strong believers and followers of Christ, whose knowledge about the Holy Spirit was defective. They didn't understand or hadn't experienced the Holy Spirit. And even though the teachers had known some of the basic Christianity uh, from contact with John the Baptist, it was they were unaware of the developments of um, Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. And the disciples had been baptized in John's baptism, but their conversion experience was accompanied by the knowledge that the fuller experience with the Holy Spirit would come, but uh, without realizing that it had already come. So sometimes we can be born again uh, in water, but we're still walking that journey and we're going, where's this Holy Spirit? I've been born into water and perhaps maybe the Lord will bless you and just bring his Holy Spirit upon you immediately. Other times it will take a bit of a season for you to walk with him through so that you may be able to experience the fullness of his Holy Spirit so that you may be able to worship him in spirit and truth. But the point that, that Paul was making here is that uh, he, he was saying to them that you, that you need to have both. You need to have the water baptism and you need to have the Holy Spirit baptism. And Paul rem remedied this, this fact by rebaptizing them in water and by leading them into a full experience with the Holy Spirit. An obvious parallel to the day of Pentecost and the Spirit's fullness was displayed by their speaking in tongues and prophesying. So let that be a message of encouragement for us during the season because while we choose to be baptized in water, we can also still have a choice to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, just like they did in the book of Acts. And how they actually waited in the upper room and saw the Lord coming, which then allowed them to speak in, in tongues and they started prophesying. But we're going to uh, have a look at uh, one, uh, two more verses here, if we have time. Revelation 7, it's talking about the seal of Israel. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, do not harm the sea or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then it goes on to read about the tribes of Israel, which I'll let you read on through uh, Revelation chapter 7 but it was uh, talking about the several interludes that interrupted the events of Revelation and John pictured the sealing of the church in order that they may survive the terrors associated with the day of wrath. The four winds of the earth represented the evil forces of devastation controlled by the four angels and the east symbolizes the source of the blessing. And the seal is an invisible sign of God's protection, not from tribulation or death, but from God's wrath. And those sealed by the Holy Spirit are God's possession, in dramatic contrast to those who bear the mark of the beast. He shall seal the saints, and they are depicted in two perspectives. The first one, uh, the first one is the saints are about to enter the great tribulation represented by the symbolic number 144,000. A thousand was the basic military division in the camp of Israel, and the result of 10 times 10 times 10, being a perfect cube symbolizing completeness, multiplied by 144 or 12 by 12. The second is a great multitude, which represents all God's redeemed through history, here seen in heaven and joined by the great tribulation church. And this is the church triumphant, uh, through the cloud of witnesses constantly surrounding the church militant. Very important for us to hold on to that truth and a good enough reason for us to continue contending for the faith. But as we close off today, I just want to read one little verse for you to make sure that we are, know who we are and whose we are. Romans chapter 8 verses 12 talks about the sonship through the Spirit. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, and these are the sons of God. 
For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then hears, hears of God and joint hears with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So while we close up today, I just want to leave that verse with you as an encouragement that as we continue to labor and go into our uh, birth pangs of his return, but also go deeper into his words so that we may be able to give a, a fuller revelation of Christ, as well as being able to be baptized with water and the Holy Spirit, as Paul did in Ephesus. I just want to encourage you, be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But make that decision to take that step with him. And if you do want to go to the land, the Holy Land, in God's time, just let me know. Just say yes, put my name down. And then let's see how we, we can honor the Lord in, in continuing in the, in, the, in the scriptures to be able to get to know him better so that when we do go we'll be able to be standing on holy ground but understanding why we are standing on holy ground. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We just honor you. We give you all the glory, Lord. We just want to bring this time to you, Lord, and ask that you will move the mountain that we can't move. We have the faith as small as a mustard seed, but we ask that you will, not by power, not by might, but by your Holy Spirit, make these things possible. For your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, sending you all the love in the world, and just keep strong. Keep in, in the word. Have a look at the scriptures that I've uh, put down in the comment section. And let me know. Give us a thumbs up if you're keen uh, to, to continue exploring, going into a baptism, uh, wanting to go to the Holy Land. Let me know. And then we can take it from there. But until then, stay blessed. Let the Lord keep you and bless you and shine His face upon you. Lift His countenance towards you and give you peace. So, until next time, Take care, sending you lots of love.